True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The young girl sits sobbing in the police interview room. She knows that her parents are gone, never coming back. But that's not the reason for her tears. These people don't understand. No one will ever understand. But Matthew can explain. She just needs to speak to him. Where is Matthew, she asks. If only she could speak with him, then she would know what to do. Matthew, though, has other plans. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 60, The Lotta Family Murders. This episode is sponsored by CBS Justice the home of true crime, available on DSTV Channel 170. Today's episode focuses on one of the scariest types of crimes, the murder of parents by their own children. If you want to hear more about similar cases where family members were driven to kill, catch the series Killer Siblings every weeknight at 8pm on CBS Justice, DSTV 170 from Monday the 11th of October. A huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters. A huge thank you goes out to Jenna Smuts and Sharice Pistana for your support on Patreon, as well as Jean-Dre de Villiers for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. There are now additional ways that you can support the show, with two online businesses providing 10% discounts when you use the code TCSA10 at checkout. You can get your health and beauty needs at King Online, and you can get all your printing requirements designed, printed and delivered by Print Crowd. You can also help to support me as an individual creator by checking out the companion podcast I created with Showmax for the Devil's Dorp documentary, or by purchasing the Krukersdorp Cult Killings audiobook on Audible, Google Play Books or Apple Books. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to keeping the show growing and improving. You can also leave a review on the podcast app you use to listen. If your podcast platform doesn't have that option, a Google or Facebook review is equally helpful. The case I'm covering today received a huge amount of media coverage when it happened. The crime itself, in which two young adults were accused of murdering their own parents, was shocking enough, but the circumstances around the crime became the focus. This case has many similarities to the Krugerstorp killings case, and I think that after all the in-depth analysis we've done of the dynamics around that case, we're now in a far better position to try and understand what happened here. Interestingly, though, as I started to dig into this case, I realized that at the heart of it is actually a theme of domestic violence. And once again, we see horrific and unbelievable ramifications of abuse and controlling relationships. In researching this case, I used the court documents related to the judgment. I used media articles, and I also read a book about the case called Innocent Acts of Evil by Dani Grundling. I'd like to thank Darren Govender for helping me to locate a copy of the book, which I'd been searching for for ages. I'd also like to thank Emma Neville for research assistance in this case. So let's get into Episode 60, 
the Lotta family murders. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Maria Magdalena Hendrina van der Merwe was born into a traditional Afrikaans family. She would be nicknamed Ricky to differentiate her from the many other Maria Magdalenas in her family. Ricky's father was a farmer, and her childhood was idyllic, except for her mother's often bizarre behaviour. Although Ricky's mother was never violent, she would often have strange things to say, and she behaved erratically, in one example, selling her kitchen furniture to liquidate some cash because she felt like buying donuts. Much later in life, Ricky's mom would be diagnosed with schizophrenia, and with medication she was able to stabilize. The early days of her strange stories and actions, though, would seemingly have a far-reaching effect on her family. When Ricky matriculated, she went to the University of Potchefstroom to study teaching, and it was here that she would meet her future husband, Johannes Pietrus Gerardus Lotta. He was three years older than Ricky, and he was studying engineering and accounting. The young man, who went by Johnny, was a maths genius, and he offered extra maths classes to his fellow students to help pay for his own tuition. Ricky needed help in this very subject, and that's how they met. The couple dated for just a year before they married in 1981. On the 15th of April, 1982, Ricky gave birth to the couple's first child, a beautiful blonde girl, almost the spitting image of her mother, who they named Nicolette. The early years of the Lotta's marriage and family life were difficult. Both Ricky and Johnny were still studying, and they were working at the same time. It was very difficult to make enough time to spend with little Nicolette. Ricky came from a very musical family, and she passed down this love of music to her daughter, who started learning to play various instruments at a young age. After Johnny graduated, he was offered a job in Butterworth in the Eastern Cape, and the Lotta family relocated. In 1986, when Nicolette was four years old, Ricky gave birth to their second daughter, Christelle, and in 1988, Johnny was very pleased to finally have a son, who they named Hardis. Now, I want to pause here and briefly chat about the third Lotta child, Christelle. I'll be honest with you, before I started researching this case, I didn't even realize that there was a third Lotta sibling. Christelle would keep herself very far removed from the drama that would envelop her family years later. In Donnie Grundling's book, he does talk about Christelle in some detail and refers to some matters of her own private life. I weighed up whether I feel that these facts have any relevance to the case, and I honestly don't think they do, so I will not be delving into Christelle too much at all here. She lived away from the home when all of this happened, and has very clearly not wanted to be involved in discussions of this case at all. She is a victim in this case too, and as such I will respect that and not use the information in the book, because I don't think it's relevant. And that brings me to another sidebar I'd like to make before continuing. The book Innocent Acts of Evil. I think that it's important to understand how this book came to be and where the information came from before we proceed. To explain this, we have to go forward in time a bit. The author, Donny Grundling, was an attorney at the time of the crime in question here. He was also a member of the same church that the Lotta family attended. He says that he was asked by a pastor at the church to assist the Lotta siblings in their defence. 
He spent several months working with both Nicolette and Hardas Lotta before discovering that he would not officially be appointed as their attorney, for reasons we'll discuss a little later. When Grundling realized he was not going to be representing the Lotters, he started writing a book. He used statements and evidence that he'd gathered from his consultations with the siblings to write the book. So essentially, the information contained in the book is a true account from the viewpoints of Nicolette and Hardas Lotta. I will say, though, that the siblings do not appear to have given their consent for this book to be written, which in normal circumstances would not be necessary, but considering the information for the book was gleaned through an attorney-client relationship, would at least in my mind be the ethical thing to do. In all fairness, the book does give us a viewpoint that we would not have otherwise had, and he did wait until the sentences were handed down to start selling the book. I will also say that Grundling does appear to have genuinely wanted to help the lot of siblings. With that out of the way, we head back to a young Lotta family, who, with their three children, are now living in the Eastern Cape. The birth of the two younger siblings could not have been easy for Nicolette. She'd been an only child for four years, and her parents had only just completed their studies and finally had more time to spend with her when her younger sister and brother came along. Shortly after Hardis was born in 1988, Johnny was headhunted by a German manufacturing company to fill a high-profile management position. The only catch was that the plant was in Durban. The Lotters could not turn down the opportunity, though, and so Ricky, Johnny, Nicolette, Cristal, and Hardis all packed up and moved to the sunny province of KwaZulu-Natal. There, the family thrived. Having spent most of their lives in landlocked provinces, the parents especially loved living at the coast, and Johnny soon bought a boat and took up fishing. Nicolette, who refers to herself as Nikki, would later say that she had always felt quite cut off from her family. She felt that her father had his work and his own interests, her mother was always busy looking after the two younger children, and she was sort of just in the middle, without a place. Nikki's parents seemed to have picked up on this, and Johnny started to invite his daughter on his fishing trips with him. She soon became her father's fishing buddy, and he came to enjoy this special time with his oldest child. It is alleged that as Nikki neared her teen years, though, things began to change. The Lotta family had always been deeply religious people, and they had raised their children that way too. Many would say that Nikki was the most religiously devout of her entire family, but her hunger for knowledge and understanding about the Christian faith never seemed sated. She seemed to be constantly seeking a more profound religious experience. It would be at church youth events that Nikki started to blossom into a young woman and try new things. A group of friends there smoked dacha, and Nikki tried it a few times. She also started becoming interested in boys, and soon she told her father that she no longer wanted to spend her weekends on the fishing boat with him. She could see he was disappointed, but she was growing up, and there was no stopping the passage of time. Nikki's deep religious convictions would serve as a mask for a lot of the behaviours she got up to from that point. She's alleged to have started a sexual relationship with a young man from the church band at the age of 14, and from there she would have several boyfriends throughout the years. As we look back, it becomes apparent that Nikki was dealing with some serious emotional issues at the time. How these issues came about is difficult to pinpoint, but she seems to have had very low self-esteem, and the relationships she got into were often unhealthy. Nikki would later admit that she started to see sex as love, 
as a teenager, and she convinced herself that if she had a physical relationship with a boy, that he would love her. Sadly, she seems to have fallen victim to several young men who, even though they were only teenagers themselves, were already exhibiting predatory and abusive behaviours. Nikki developed the eating disorder anorexia, and although she seems to have recovered physically from that, the emotional issues that would cause the disorder just seem to be transferred onto other things. Nikki's parents had no idea what she was doing behind their backs. They knew she had boyfriends, but they were convinced that she was still sticking to her religious convictions and was not having sex before marriage. In fact, Nikki hid her second life so well that not even her brother suspected what she was doing. When he found out much later, he was shocked. When Nikki was 16, she discovered a secret that would change her family forever. She was sitting in her father's car when she found a cigarette with lipstick on it and a Spider-Man figurine. She asked her father about the items, and he said they belonged to his secretary. Nikki was familiar with her father's secretary. She'd become a friend of their family and sometimes babysat for her two younger siblings. But she couldn't understand why the woman would have been in her father's car. Nikki would later tell her mother about this, and Ricky told her daughter that she had suspected her father was having an affair. Unfortunately, rather than handling the matter privately, Ricky Lotta chose to have the discussion with her children present. Both Nikki and Hardis would never forget the moments that they saw their father, who they had only known as a strong and brave man, on his knees, in tears, begging their mother to stop accusing him. Whether or not Johnny ever admitted to an affair, his wife believed him to have been guilty. Ricky decided that she was not going to lose her husband, though, as well as the family she'd worked so hard to build. She also decided that she was not going to depend on her husband anymore, and she went back to working as a teacher so that she could have her own income. Nikki and Hardis would say that after this incident, their father was never the same. He started drinking heavily and got into the habit of coming home from work, sitting down with a whiskey and drinking until he could no longer keep his eyes open. Although the family is patched up, the cracks are easy to see, and the children report feeling emotionally insecure and anxious from this point on. When Nikki matriculated with excellent results, her family wanted her to study medicine or graphic design, but the girl could only see a future for herself in music and to their credit, her parents put their support behind her. Nikki was still very much dealing with her emotional difficulties and the abusive and controlling relationships she'd experienced on her own. she drifted away from religion during this time, finding fulfillment in other things. But when she started music college, that changed. She met a young girl who was a devout Christian, and Nikki remembers thinking that the girl looked so happy and serene, and she just wanted some of what she had. At 19, Nicolette Lotta rediscovers her fervor for Christianity. She makes a vow of celibacy with herself, saying that the next man she has sex with will be her husband. Nikki's family would say that she had always exhibited some paranoid delusions throughout her life, and these had been, in part, made worse when she'd spent time with her grandmother, Boki. Boki was Ricky's mother, who would later be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Grandmother and granddaughter had a strong bond, and they would spend hours in the kitchen baking when the family visited the grandparents' Freyhead farm. During these baking sessions, Boki would regale her daughter with tales of tokoloshas, curses, demons, and evil spirits, and Nikki grew up with these stories forming part of her core belief system. When Nikki reaffirmed her faith, her delusions seemed to return with even greater force. At this time, 
the Lotta's domestic worker who had served as nanny to the children throughout their childhood, passed away. They hired a new domestic worker, and Nikki took an instant dislike to the woman. When Nikki found out that the woman's son was a Sangoma, she was beside herself. She did everything she could to get the woman fired, and soon the domestic worker hated Nikki just as much. Nikki was certain that the woman had put a curse on her home, and that this was why her family was not as happy as they used to be. Her parents told her that she was being ridiculous, and refused to fire the woman just because Nikki didn't like her. It does seem that the domestic worker did her best to antagonize Nikki, simply because she didn't like her. She would find dead birds in the street and put them underneath Nikki's window to drive her delusions. Nikki clung to religion, certain that if she was just faithful enough, she would be able to defeat these curses that had been put upon her. She started to fast for long periods at a time, and when her hair started to fall out because of this, she believed that a demon was pulling her hair out. She said that she felt an intense heaviness about her all of the time, and that she just couldn't shake it. Sadly, looking from the outside in now, it's clear that Nikki was experiencing significant mental health issues. She needed professional treatment. But in her head at that time, the explanation was not that simple. Nikki's feeling of isolation only intensified when her parents did not believe her delusions of persecution. This became worse when she started going from church to church, trying to find help for her curses and demons, and no one seemed to take her seriously. Nikki's delusions at this time were significant. When she found frogs that had been ridden over in her driveway by cars, she became convinced that this was part of a curse. She walked from house to house in the streets, looking for more squashed frogs. A few houses had the same, which would be entirely normal for KZN, but Nikki started to believe that the domestic workers that worked at those homes were in cahoots with their domestic worker. Although she was still attending church at this time, people there could see how she was going over the edge, and they were wary of her. The domestic worker that worked for the Lotta family belonged to the Zionist church, and Nikki started to believe that the church was out to get her. When the Zionist church started renting space at her own church's premises for their services, Nikki lost it. She demanded that the pastor remove the Zionists from the church premises. When he refused, she left and never returned. Nikki was now completely isolated in her world of suspicions and delusion. Although her mental health was poor, Nikki's music career was blossoming. She'd started an all-female jazz ensemble, and the group was hugely popular. When Nikki turned 21, her parents bought her a car for a birthday. She needed it now to get to her gigs and transport her music equipment. She also worked as a waitress at a local pub. Nikki worked hard, but her delusions that she was being cursed continued to build. When Nikki's younger sister Christelle matriculated, she decided to study at the University of Stellenbosch. Although sad to see their middle child leave the nest, the Lotters supported her, and they even purchased a holiday home in Hans Bar in the Western Cape, so that they could spend holidays there as a family. Hardis Lotta had grown into a handsome young man, but he was the most reserved of his siblings. He was obsessed with computers, and definitely knew that this was the work he wanted to do when he grew up. Hardis has been described as a quiet young man, and shy, but polite and kind. He finds it difficult to make friends, but he has a small, close group of friends with similar interests in computers and gaming. Although he says that he would have liked to have had a girlfriend at the time, he found it too difficult to talk to girls. By 2006, 
Nicolette Lotta is 24 years old, and her neurotic behaviour has not abated. When her band goes through a rough patch, she blames the curses. Her behaviour becomes stranger and stranger. On one occasion, she sees a can of multi oil in her father's garage, and instead reads the words as muti oil. Her father comes home to find that his oldest daughter has anointed the entire outside of the house with the can of oil. Then, in February 2007, Nikki finally finds someone that is willing to listen to her. She's put in touch with a woman in Phoenix who is alleged to perform exorcisms. Nikki is elated that she may have found the help she needs and immediately gets in touch with the woman. On the first occasion that Nicolette Lotta drives out to Phoenix to meet with Venla and her daughter Claudette, the woman listens to Nicolette's woes. She commiserates with her and tells her that what she's saying is absolutely believable. Venla claims to deal with curses and demons like this every day. But Nikki shouldn't worry. She can help her. Of course, that help will be expensive. Nikki tells her that money is no object. She will give everything she has just to rid herself of this evil presence. So they begin. First, Venla says they have to have lunch. So Nikki takes the woman to the local supermarket and pays for all the groceries for their lunch. The woman then spends the next few hours dancing around Nikki with incense, chanting things that Nikki can't understand. Toward the end of the cleansing session, Venla's daughter Claudette, who was sitting on a nearby bed smoking, abruptly sits up, puts out her cigarette, and starts to thrash about on the bed, growling and screeching. Nikki is horrified, but Venda tells her not to worry. She and her daughter work together, and Claudette is the vessel that is used to get rid of the demons. Eventually, the young woman stops thrashing about and sits up again, asking her mother what happened. It's a good thing she put her cigarette out before she became possessed. She may have burned herself. Nikki is amazed at how light she feels. She's completely sold on Venla's powers. The woman has made it clear, though, that this is not a one-off thing. It will take some time to completely rid Nikki of these curses and demons, so she'll have to come back. Next time, she should stay the night. Before Nikki leaves, she is introduced to Claudette's husband. The man is almost twice as old as Claudette, and he goes by the title Reverend. He has a little church of his own, he tells Nikki, that he runs from the premises. Nikki can't believe her luck, that she's found such wonderful, godly people to help her with her problems. She arranges the sleepover session for the very next weekend. Nikki's parents have started to become seriously concerned with her behaviour at this point. Her mother wonders whether her daughter may have inherited her grandmother's mental health disorders. While schizophrenia is not necessarily a strictly genetic disorder, it has been known to impact several generations of the same family line. Researchers do not believe that there is any single schizophrenia gene as such, but rather that certain combinations of several genes may predispose people in the same family to developing schizophrenia. Ricky and Johnny Lotta discuss whether they should consider sending Nikki to a psychiatrist. While her parents are considering medical interventions, Nikki is pursuing her own cure for her woes, and she once again heads out to Phoenix to meet with Venla, this time for an overnight session of exorcism. She would have no idea that this trip will change the entire course of her life forever. Nikki spends the 18th of February 2007 with Venla and then buys the whole family KFC for dinner. 
While the family is eating, there's a knock at the door, and Nikki is completely shocked when a tall and rather overweight boy strolls into the lounge, drops to his knee in front of her, and shoves a bunch of plastic flowers into her hand. The young man, who Nikki has never seen in her life, then proceeds to tell her that he loves her and asks her to marry him. Matthew Naidu has begun his love bombing. It would later emerge that Matthew Naidu was a neighbour of the family, and after Nikki's last visit, Claudette's husband, the Reverend, has told Matthew about the pretty blonde girl who has her own car and lived in Westville and was paying his mother-in-law to rid her of her demons and curses. The room explodes in laughter at Matthew's antics, but he seems dead serious, even a little annoyed that he's being laughed at. Nicky is horrified and tells him he's being ridiculous. Not to be deterred, though, Matthew plants himself down, helps himself to the KFC, and stays there until Nicky goes to sleep. The morning after Nikki's overnight exorcism and curse removal session, she's eager to get home. She's feeling so much better, but she also wants to get out before that strange young man comes back. True to form, though, when Nikki gets to her car outside, Matthew is there. He tries to make conversation, but Nikki rebuffs him, gets into the car and drives off. She doesn't think about Matthew again until later on, when she receives an SMS. It reads, I love you. I hope you got home safely. Nikki doesn't recognise the number that the message comes from, so she replies asking who the sender is. The reply comes, It's Matthew. You looked a little sad when you left. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Nikki's defences go down. She thinks that it's really sweet that he wants to check on her, so she responds. Matthew Naidu is 20 years old when Nikki meets him, but for Nikki, dating younger men has become the norm. Matthew is not terribly well-liked in his neighbourhood. He's not disliked, but he's not very popular either. Matthew is known for his tall tales. What he lacked in school smarts when his teachers warned his single mother, Rita, that her son may have learning difficulties, he more than made up for with his gift of the gab. Matthew soon found that he loved to debate. He could talk people in circles, and he puts the gift to use as often as he can. Matthew hasn't had a father figure in his life. His father left when he was two years old, but he does have many uncles and one of these uncles recently got him a job packing boxes at a clothing company. He works six days a week for 290 rand. Matthew believes that he deserves a better life, though. He doesn't see why he should have to work like a slave for such meagre money. When he meets Nikki and sees what her life is like, living in the suburbs, having her own car, and having parents that will give her whatever she wants, This just affirms for him that the world is a terribly unfair place. Why should this skinny girl be able to drop so much money to pay his crazy neighbour to remove demons when he has to work his butt off just to afford food? Matthew has already decided he likes what Claudette's husband does. He wants to be a religious leader one day too. In fact, Bible study and knowledge of the Christian religion is something he is very skilled at. He can recite entire sections of the Bible from memory. Plus, he likes the fact that religious leaders demand respect. After that first round of text messages, Nikki and Matthew don't stop. They exchange flirty messages, and soon they've arranged to see each other again. Nikki discovers that Matthew enjoys ocean baskets and KFC, and they spend many evenings at the mall. Nikki understands when Matthew can't pay for dates, though, and she doesn't mind footing the bill when they go out. 
Very soon after Nikki and Matthew start seeing each other, Matthew turns the conversation to spiritual matters. One of the things that Nikki likes best about him is that he's a Christian, and she is amazed at his extensive knowledge of the Bible. Soon, though, Matthew reveals that he is not just an ordinary believer. He has special powers. Nikki is eager to hear more, and Matthew tells her that he knows things about people that others don't. He starts to tell her very personal things that she's experiencing at home. Her hair falling out, the fact that there is a battle between good and evil happening in her home. Nikki is amazed. Of course, she doesn't think for a minute that these are all things that his neighbour Venla has told him. Matthew's description of his spiritual powers grows on a daily basis. Each day he adds a little piece to the story, building on the foundation he has laid before. He's testing the waters. He's seeing how far he can push the narrative. Soon, he reveals that he has the power to heal. If there's anything Nikki feels she needs, it's healing. Within weeks, Nikki and Matthew are in a sexual relationship. Nikki made a vow to herself that the next man she had sex with would be her husband, and she plans to keep that vow. She has already decided that Matthew Nadu is the man God intends to be her husband. Nikki becomes further convinced of Matthew's healing powers when she starts to feel better when she spends time with him. Things at home seem better too, and she is sure the curse is lifting. Nikki does not immediately tell her parents about Matthew. As she has done in the past, she keeps the fact that he is her boyfriend a secret. Even though she's 24 years old, she still feels the need to keep up the appearance of being a chaste young woman. She also doesn't know how her parents will react to her being in an interracial relationship. She is white, and Matthew is Indian. Her family is quite traditional, and although all the children have had friends from different race groups before, she is unsure about how her parents will feel about her dating someone from outside her race group. So for the first few weeks, she presents Matthew as her very good friend and spiritual companion. Matthew has found Nikki to be very accepting of his claims of spiritual superiority, so he takes the story one level higher, quite literally. He reveals to Nikki that he is actually a spiritual being. He is the third son of God, sent to earth to complete a very holy mission. Matthew has thus far shown a keen sense of observation and an ability to turn events around to prove his special powers. So by the time he reveals this secret to Nikki, she is completely convinced that he is who he says he is. She feels blessed, and as though Matthew is the answer to her prayers. It would not be very long, though, until she would see a different, less angelic side of Matthew. One night, she and Matthew were walking through the mall when she sees one of her ex-boyfriends. The boy greets her and she greets back, but when she does, she lets go of Matthew's hand. Whether the action was intentional or coincidental, Matthew takes it as a slight. He storms off and Nikki runs behind him. At Nikki's car, he demands to be taken home. As Nikki is the only one with transport, she's been shuttling back and forth between Westville and Phoenix. Nikki gets into the driver's seat beside a seething Matthew and has barely made it onto the main road before he explodes. He demands to know who that boy was and why she let go of his hand when she saw him. When Nikki admits that he was an ex of hers, Matthew's anger reaches its peak. He starts to punch her while she's driving, calling her names. He starts to bring up her past that she shared with him in confidence and tells her that she has used goods 
and she doesn't deserve to be with the Son of God. Initially stunned at the sudden violence, Nikki soon pulls over and orders Matthew out of her car. He gets out, and she drives off. A few minutes later, though, she starts to feel guilty. What if something happens to Matthew? She turns around and pulls up next to him. She apologizes and begs him to get back in the car. Matthew, of course, has an explanation for his sudden violence. That wasn't him that hit her just then. It was one of the other beings that live inside him. He explains to Nikki that he has three separate parts to him, and one of those parts is a violent and evil person. The three parts of Matthew have different voices, and in the weeks that follow, Matthew starts to exhibit these personality parts on cue. His eyelids will flutter, and then he'll start to speak in a different voice. When Nikki hears the evil voice, she knows that she is going to be beaten, because the first incident in the car is not the last time that Matthew physically assaults Nikki. She regularly has bruises she needs to cover up with makeup. But she's convinced herself that this is the price she has to pay to be with the Son of God. It's her own fault because of all the sins she committed before she met Matthew. Nikki starts to bring Matthew home. She still presents him as her friend, though, at least in the beginning. It soon becomes clear to the Lotters, though, that there is a lot more to their daughter's relationship with this young man than she claims. Although their traditional views do mean that they are taken aback by the fact that Nikki has chosen a partner outside of her race group, they do not react poorly. Johnny Lotta simply doesn't go out of his way to make conversation with the young man, but Ricky tries to be friendly and welcoming. All the parents ask, as was the rule with other boyfriends, is that Matthew should not sleep over in Nikki's room. The couple agree, and even though Nikki has to drive him all the way back to Phoenix, Matthew leaves every night, at least in the beginning. One night... When Nikki's younger sister is home for a few days, she sees her sister sneaking her boyfriend back in, and he doesn't leave until morning. The girl tells her mother, and Ricky is furious. Nicolette insists that Matthew did not sleep over, but her mother doesn't believe her. So for a little while, at least until her sister has gone back to Stellenbosch, Nikki continues driving Matthew home every night. In March of 2007, Ricky convinces Nicolette to see a psychiatrist. She wants to be sure that the delusions she's previously seen in her daughter are not symptoms of something more serious. Nikki goes to see the psychiatrist, Dr. Schliebusch, but unfortunately Matthew has already convinced her not to share anything too personal with him. He makes her believe that if she tells him anything about the difficulties she is experiencing with the curses and the demons, they will lock her up in a psychiatric hospital. Matthew says that this is just clearly her parents' way of trying to control her. Dr. Schliebusch reports back to Ricky that Nicolette was very evasive, and he will need to see her again to try and get a better feel for any issues she may be experiencing. Privacy in the Lotta home is always respected. The children's rooms are their domains, and the parents don't enter without knocking. When they leave the house, their doors are closed, and their parents do not enter without their consent. It is this unspoken rule in the home that helps Matthew to get away with what he does next. He starts to complain to Nikki that he's tired of travelling back to Phoenix all the time, He's also sick of having to work like a slave at his job when she earns so much more money with her band gigs and her work at the pub. Nikki is also getting exhausted from all the driving, and it's costing her a fortune in petrol money. So she suggests that he come and live there. Of course, they know her parents will never allow it, but they aren't home during the day, 
and it'll just look like he's visiting in the evenings like normal. As for his job, Nikki says that he should just quit and come work as the manager for her band instead. Matthew, of course, knows absolutely nothing about the entertainment industry, but Nikki, by this point, thinks he is capable of anything he sets his mind to. He is the son of God, after all. Although Nikki is the one that opens the door, Matthew does not hesitate to walk straight through it and make himself very comfortable on the other side. When Nikki says that her band makes such good money on their gigs, that there'll be enough for him to draw from it, he could not be happier. But then I'll have to ask you for money all the time, he says. Nikki says he doesn't have to worry. He can have her ATM card. Matthew's face lights up. Nikki has grown up in a culture where the man in the relationship is usually in charge of the finances. This is second nature to her, and in her mind, Matthew is her future husband. She has no idea that she has just enabled the second phase of Matthew's control over her. She now cannot make any financial decisions without his consent. The third phase of Matthew's abuse starts almost as soon as he is permanently living with her. He frames his sexual abuse of her as her punishment for the sin she's committed. God's son is cleansing her. Nikki works a full shift at the bar and comes back home, but is not allowed to sleep. Matthew has been sleeping the entire day, and he's not tired. Matthew is also a head and shoulders taller than Nikki, and he weighs more than twice what she does. She has only a single bed in her room, and she often cannot fit on the bed with Matthew, who sprawls out inconsiderately, so she sleeps on the floor. Even though Nikki's parents have never openly said anything about them not wanting her to date Matthew for racial reasons, he starts to needle Nikki about how racist her parents are. He tells her that he sees how they look at him and they're disgusted by him. Hardest Lotta feels differently to his parents. From the moment the young man planted himself on the couch and they both figured out they loved WrestleMania and Cartoon Network, Hardis was sold on his sister's new boyfriend. He soon finds out that Matthew is living in the house, but he promises to keep their secret. The Lotters do not notice that Matthew is living there. Johnny spends very little time at home, and on weeknights he is usually under the influence of alcohol and in bed by 8pm. Ricky works full-time now too, and spends time at the gym. By the time she gets home to find Matthew in her lounge, she's ready to make dinner, clean up, and get to bed herself. Matthew has told the Lotters that he works as a marketing manager for a clothing brand. But they aren't the only parents that he's lying to. He's told his own mother that he's moved to London to work for Richard Branson. He found this lie easier than having to make a plan to visit her all the time, he says. For Nikki's part, she seems to accept these lies as part of what the Son of God has to do to accomplish his holy mission. She's also secretly glad that she doesn't have to see Matthew's family anymore. Not only did she get the feeling that they didn't really like her, but every time they'd go there, Matthew would be in a huge mood afterwards, and then his angry personality would come out, and she would be beaten. Matthew's violence does not just extend to humans. He tells Nikki that he hates animals, which is unfortunate, as Nikki is an animal lover. She's had a cat since she was a child, and the family has an elderly dog too. I find it very difficult to talk about animal cruelty, so I am not going to go into the details, but suffice to say that Nikki's cat goes missing very soon after Matthew moves in, and the cat's body is found in the neighbor's yard. 
the family dog, survives a severe beating. While living with Nikki, Matthew has noticed that she likes to write in diaries. She has a whole bookcase with old diaries. Feeling left out, he asks for a blank book and starts to write his own diary. He also uses Nikki's diaries to get information about her past, her hopes and prayers, and then he uses that information to convince her that he can read her mind. When Nikki is due to return to Dr. Schliebusch for her follow-up appointments, Matthew decides to accompany her. Again, she is evasive and reveals little. When the psychiatrist walks Nikki out into reception, Matthew is sprawled on his couch with his legs up, blocking their path. The doctor asks Matthew to make way, and Matthew explodes. You just have to show that you're the boss around here, don't you? He screams at the shocked man. You can just step over my legs. Matthew stands up and puts his arm around Nikki, half pulling her out of reception. Schliebusch reports back to Ricky again that he's made no headway with Nikki. He does comment that her boyfriend was with her at the appointment, though, and there's an odd dynamic between the couple. Before Nikki met Matthew, her band was regularly booked up. She did a great job of getting them gigs, and performers and customers were happy. When Matthew takes over, that all changes. He tries to increase their fee to such an extent that almost no one can afford to book them. The local shopping centre, which was a regular holiday gig for the band, asks them never to return after Matthew decides to get on stage during a performance and tell dirty jokes during lunchtime in a mall packed with children. At a restaurant gig, Nikki is approached by a man that works for Empire Records. He gives her his card and tells her that the band is really good and he'd love to hear a demo from them and maybe meet them at his studio in Johannesburg sometime. Nikki is over the moon, but when she tells Matthew, he tears up the man's business card, telling her he can't believe she's so stupid. Clearly the man just wants to get in her pants. Nikki says that she didn't get that vibe from him at all. But no sooner are the words out of her mouth than she regrets them. Matthew screams in her face and punches her. Later that night, he makes her cut her hair and throw out all of her attractive work clothes so that she doesn't draw attention to herself during gigs. The gigs start to dry up, and now Nikki only has her income from the bar to support them both. Considering the fact that Matthew proposed to Nikki the first day he met her, and they regularly discuss marriage, Matthew puts off setting a date to marry Nikki. Eventually, they decide on a civil ceremony, which is to take place on the 12th of August 2007, but Matthew stands Nikki up. He later tells her that he received a tip that the CIA and Interpol had picked up his marriage application on the Home Affairs system, and if he arrived, they were going to arrest him on fake charges in order to stop his holy mission. Nikki accepts the explanation. By this point, Matthew has Nikki well and truly convinced that her parents are evil messengers from the devil, and that they are selfish and trying to control her life. Then he starts to work on Hardis. When he and Nikki eventually reveal to Hardis that they are on a spiritual mission and that Matthew is the son of God, the young man is taken aback. He'll later say that Matthew knew so much about what went on in his head and things that he thought no one else knew. But if it wasn't for his older sister, who he trusted so implicitly, and her assurances that Matthew was indeed telling the truth, he may not have believed it. With Nikki sold on Matthew's story, Hardis was now all in too. Throughout September and October 2007, Matthew seems to work on Hardis. 
Of course, there are constant examples of how evil their parents are, but he also starts to tell the siblings that there are things about their parents they don't know. He tells them that they were both abused by their parents when they were babies, and they just don't remember it. The siblings are shocked, but Matthew convinces them that this is true, and it's just another reason that their parents are evil. The incremental way that Matthew builds up toward his end goal is clear in hindsight. He builds up his control in levels. He tests his boundaries very carefully to see what he can achieve with each of the siblings. One of the ways he seems to get the siblings used to the idea of doing bad things to their parents is by getting them to spit in their alcohol bottles. He claims, of course, that this has a spiritual purpose and that their spit is holy and will act like holy water in the evil bodies of their parents. Matthew constantly teases Hardis over his inadequacies with women. When Hardis makes the mistake of telling Matthew that there's a girl he likes, Matthew forces him to send the girl a message on Facebook. He dictates the message while Hardis types, Soon it becomes clear that Matthew's intention is to use this girl to expand his following. He dictates a message detailing how Hardis is following the Son of God, and they are on a holy mission. The girl is horrified and tells Hardis to leave her alone. As he did with Nicolette, Matthew starts to isolate Hardis from the world around him. Although the young man is already not very sociable, Matthew takes his cell phone and deletes every single cell phone number so that he can no longer contact his small circle of friends. He starts to physically assault Hardis, framing it as punishment for his sins. Matthew's jealousy knows no bounds, and it grows daily. One day, when Nikki gets home from work, He's torn up all of her photographs from his school days and gotten rid of all of the mementos that remind her of her friends. With Matthew having destroyed the band's reputation in the industry, Nikki was desperately clinging to her job at the pub and taking every shift she could. But the more she worked, the more annoyed Matthew became. So he started to hang around at the pub while she was working. He watches Nikki like a hawk and becomes aggressive with male customers. In November that year, Nikki's employer puts a policy in place to stop any family members or partners of staff hanging around the bar while they're working. This is specifically aimed at stopping Matthew from coming there, but he pays it no mind. He continues on as though the rules don't apply to him. The pub has no choice but to dismiss Nikki. They now have no source of income. Hardis is still studying and receives pocket money from his parents. With Matthew having convinced him that they are all now on a holy mission together, the young man starts handing his money over to Matthew. To accomplish absolute financial control, Matthew cuts up Hardis' cards and even his wallet. He sees a job vacancy advertised at a local coffee shop and makes a big show with Nicky about how he saw a job in a vision. When Nicky is hired, she's convinced that the job is all Matthew's doing. In December 2007, the Lotta family plans to go to their holiday home in Khan's Bay for a month. Nicky can't go because she has to work, but Hardis is very excited about the holiday But then, Matthew tells him he cannot go. He tells Hardis that he can't be alone with his evil parents, and he needs him in Durban so that they can work on their holy mission. Disappointed and still not entirely sure what the holy mission is, Hardis relents and stays behind. Matthew will use this month to solidify his hold on Hardis and Nikki. When Nikki isn't working, she and Hardis must carry out spiritual training with Matthew. 
This usually involves remaining on their knees for hours at a time and praying for Matthew's mission. During this time, Matthew escalates the level of ridiculousness in his claims, slowly testing the waters to see just how much the siblings will believe. Now, he doesn't speak with voices of just his three alternate personalities or God himself, but he also becomes possessed by famous people. His eyelids flutter, and suddenly he speaks in a slightly different voice, claiming to be Einstein or Richard Branson. As Branson, he tests their loyalty by offering the siblings one million pounds to betray Matthew. The siblings don't even hesitate. They decline. Having confirmed their ultimate loyalty, Matthew introduces the idea that Johnny and Ricky must die. Although there is initial hesitation, they are now so entirely convinced that their parents are messengers of evil that acceptance of the idea is just a heartbeat away. Matthew also uses this month to figure out exactly how much money the Lotters have. He goes through all of their personal documentation, figures out what assets they have, reads the terms of their life insurances. If the Lotters were just an annoyance to him before, they are now his tickets to the lifestyle he feels he deserves. When Ricky and Johnny return home on the 18th of January 2008, Matthew is annoyed because he has to hide again. For a month, he's been the king of the Lotter's home, and he becomes sullen and short-tempered. Nikki is significantly abused during this time, and she barely gets any sleep as Matthew demands sex as soon as she gets home from work. As a result, she is often late for work and eventually loses her job. Matthew is undeterred. He has another idea to get money. He's noticed that Johnny leaves his credit card on his bedside table when he leaves the house. The trio find his pin and withdraw 2,000 rand from his account. When Johnny comes home, Hardis and Matthew convince him that his account must have been hacked. Johnny changes his pin number and it happens again. Another 2,000 rand. Johnny cannot understand how people are using his card when it's sitting on his bedside table, and he changed his pin. Matthew suggests that he get a brand new card, which Johnny does. When he comes home with the card, Matthew waits until he's asleep and opens the envelope the card is in with a razor blade. At that time, a pin was still issued inside the envelope with the card. They take the pin, and he and Nikki drive to the mall to withdraw another 2,000 rand. They then replace the card and the pin and reseal the envelope. The next morning when Johnny wakes up to find a message on his phone that another 2,000 rand has been withdrawn from his account, he goes to the police and opens a case. Detective Duma at Westville Police Station gets the CCTV footage from the mall ATM that the money was drawn from and views it with Johnny. The man withdrawing the money in the footage is wearing a balaclava face mask, but the sweatshirt he's wearing looks familiar to Johnny. He can't place it, though. Then he looks in the parking lot behind the ATM, and in amongst the parked cars, he sees his daughter's green Uno. He tells Detective Duma that's his daughter's car, and they both agree that it's likely not a coincidence. Duma explains to Johnny that he can go and arrest Nicolette, but she will have a criminal record if she's found guilty. Johnny cannot do that to his daughter. He feels he would be destroying her future, so instead he starts keeping his credit card in a safe at work. He does tell his family about the footage, and Matthew confirms that they were at the mall that night. They were there to watch movies, though and of course they had nothing to do with the theft. Johnny would like to believe that his daughter is telling the truth, but deep down, he no longer trusts her or her boyfriend. When Matthew hears that his sweatshirt was identifiable in the footage, he gives it to Hardis, 
and tells him to hide it under his mattress. With the credit card theft now no longer an option, Matthew has Harder steal his mother's handbag. They get very little from the theft, though, as they don't have her PIN number. They sell her cell phone and dump her bag in another area, leaving her Edgar's card in it so that it can be identified. When Ricky realizes her cell phone is gone, she's completely freaked out. The house was locked. The alarm was armed. How on earth did her bag get out of the house? Not once does she suspect her own children. She is even more freaked out when her bag is found in a very dodgy part of town. Someone must have been in her house, she thinks. This is just the beginning of the campaign of fear that Matthew Naidu starts against Johnny and Ricky Lotta. He is already planning their demise and comes up with a way to deflect attention away from him. Matthew buys a burner phone and starts to send threatening messages to Johnny Lotta. At first, Johnny keeps the messages to himself, but then both Nikki and Hardis claim to be attacked in separate incidents by men who knew their names. Matthew assaults the two before they make these claims so that they will be believed. Johnny and Ricky are terrified for their children and cannot understand who would have anything against them. Matthew starts sending letters to the Lotters. They are both threatening and worded in such a way that they start to create division between Johnny and Ricky. The letters imply that the person that's after them is the husband of a woman Johnny has had an affair with. Johnny denies that this can be true, but the seed of doubt is sown. The Lotters go to the police with the threats. The same detective that worked on the theft case meets with them. He takes the evidence from them, but doesn't give them much hope for locating the people. It could just be a prank, after all. The company that Johnny works for takes these threats very seriously, though. They are an international company, and in some of the other countries they work in, their executives have experienced kidnapping for ransom crimes. They fear that this may now be starting in South Africa, so they hire a private investigator. Although the Lotters do not directly suspect Matthew of being behind the threats, they have become very suspicious of the young man who has so drastically changed their daughter. Johnny does a background check on Matthew and discovers that he has lied about his work history and his studies. Although the couple were hoping to find a criminal record, there is none. But Matthew's lies are proof enough that he is not the person they believed him to be. Ricky arranges for Detective Duma to be at the house when she confronts Matthew. She tells the young man that she knows he has been lying to them, and she suspects him of more, but the lies are enough that she never wants to see him in her home again. Matthew immediately goes on the defensive, claiming that Ricky only hates him because he's not white. Nikki tells her mother that if Matthew is not allowed in their house, then she will leave too. Ricky begs her daughter to stay as she packs her belongings into her green Uno, but the girl will hear nothing of it. Where Matthew goes, she goes. For the month of June 2008, Matthew and Nikki rent a room in a boarding house. Matthew pawns Nikki's sound equipment, but there are no takeaways or trips to the movies during that month. Matthew seethes at the indignity of having to eat noodles and bread. Nikki is just happy to be with Matthew. Ricky and Johnny, though, are desperate to get their daughter back home and send Hardis out to speak with her. As a group, they plan that Nikki will agree to move back home, and then they will sneak Matthew back into her room in a few days. They know that they can hide Matthew for a while without her parents knowing he's there. They've done so for long enough. Nikki tells her parents that she has a new job that she's starting at the end of July. This is a lie. 
but the family agree that she'll move back in until she starts the new job and then she'll find a place of her own. They have now put a time limit on their plans. There is no job, but by the end of July, her parents will be asking questions again. It's now or never. When the idea of killing their parents is raised again, Matthew promises the siblings that he will do the killing. He wants to make it look like natural causes, though, so he tells them that they'll need to kill Johnny first, and then Ricky a month or so later. Matthew thinks he'll quite enjoy watching Ricky grieve her husband. The first plan they come up with is to add pure alcohol to Johnny's whiskey. They hope that by increasing the alcohol content, they'll give him alcohol poisoning and he'll die. Johnny has been drinking his entire adult life, though, and all that happens is that he gets sleepy quicker than usual. The next attempt involves a poisonous plant. The trio go to the botanical gardens and tap a plant of its sap. They then add this to Johnny's whiskey. But Johnny sees the white sap at the bottom of the bottle and throws the whole thing out without even taking a sip. Their time is running out, and Matthew is getting desperate. He comes up with another plan. This time, they decide to take both parents out in one go. Matthew tells the siblings that if he injects their parents with a syringe filled with air, it will cause an embolism and they will die of heart attacks. He promises to do the injecting himself. All the siblings need to do is immobilize their mother while their father is asleep. On Saturday the 19th of July, Matthew pawns Hardis's digital camera, and the trio purchase a taser gun, needles, and latex gloves. The plan is that Hardis will knock his mother out with a taser, subdue her, then Nicolette will collect Matthew and he will inject her with the air-filled syringe, and they will do the same with sleeping Johnny. Matthew buys movie tickets for him and Nicolette so that they can set up an alibi just in case. That night, Nicolette drops Matthew off at the mall and returns to the house. Johnny is already asleep, and the girl asks her mother if she'd like to join her in the kitchen for tea. Mother and daughter sit at the table. Ricky's back is facing the doorway, so she has no idea that Hardis is sneaking up on her. Hardis puts the taser to his mother's neck and fires it. Very little happens. The trio purchased the cheapest taser they could find. They only tested it once, and when it only let off a little spark, they decided it just needed to be charged and didn't test it again. The taser, though, is faulty, and there's no way it's going to knock anyone out. Realising that he is going to have to subdue his mother some other way, Hardis wraps his arm around her neck. Ricky initially thinks he's playing around, but as he begins to squeeze, she fights back. Nicolette sees that things are going south quickly and goes to help her brother. Hardis holds Ricky down while Nicolette pummels her mother's face with her fists until she stops moving. They then cable tie her legs and arms together in case she wakes up. Hardis stays with her while Nicolette calls Matthew to tell him that things have gone wrong and she needs his help. Even though Ricky is in a half-unconscious state, the minute she hears her daughter utter Matthew's name, her eyes fly open. It's as if she knows that this is all his doing. She starts to fight Hardis again, and he headbutts his mother to knock her out. At some point during the struggle, while Hardis tries to silence his mother's shouts, she bites his finger. Nicolette drives to the mall to fetch Matthew. When he arrives and sees the state Ricky is in, he is furious. He tells Nicolette that it is her fault that this has all gone wrong, so now she has to fix it. He instructs Nikki to tie a cable tie around her mother's arm and inject her with air. Then he leaves the room. Nicolette is shaking so much it takes several attempts to get the needle in Ricky's arm. 
She injects the air into her veins several times and waits. Nothing happens. Nikki goes to Matthew, explaining that her mother is not dying. A set of knives sits next to their bed. They purchased it when they were living in the boarding house so that they could prepare food. Matthew leans down and hands her a knife. Nikki stares at the knife for a moment before taking it. He tells her where to stab her mother to kill her, and she goes back into the kitchen. By the time she straddles her mother and raises the knife over her head, the woman is waking up again. She looks at her daughter and then her son, and utters her last words before the knife is plunged into her. My children, why are you doing this? I love you. Nikki will return to her mother on three occasions and stab her several times each until eventually she stops breathing. In all, she has 11 stab wounds. When it's done, they call Matthew to the kitchen. He instructs them to collect the needles, taser and cable ties and put them in plastic bags. The knife is left laying next to Ricky's body. Nicolette is covered in blood and he tells her to change and put her clothing in the bags. Then he turns to Hardis and tells him that everything has changed. He says that God is angry because he messed up the plan and now they have to come up with a different cover story. Also, Hardis must now kill his father, Matthew says. Hardis is terrified and initially refuses but Matthew tells him that Nikki has killed their mother, so now he must also play his part. Then he adds that God has told him that if Hardis wants to repent and go to heaven after he has killed his father, he will have to hang himself. Matthew has Hardis write a suicide note, explaining that he killed his parents. Nikki does not want Hardis to have to commit suicide, but Matthew tells her it's the only way. Really, what Matthew is doing is coming up with the most convenient of excuses. If it looks like Hardis lost his mind and killed his parents, and then himself, there'll be no questions asked. It will also be one less person to share the inheritance with. Matthew explains to Hardis how to make a garret with electrical wire and exercise handles, and tells him how to strangle his father. Then he and Nikki say their goodbyes and leave for the mall to set up their alibi. Although Matthew hopes that Hardis will be able to kill himself, he is already planning for the other eventuality. He keeps the evidence they collected from the kitchen floor with him. If they go back to the house and Hardis has not killed himself, they will dispose of the evidence. If he is dead, they will put it back on the kitchen floor. It is 10pm by the time they arrive at the mall. They walk around for a bit so that the CCTV can pick them up, and then they go to buy ice creams. Matthew makes a big deal about tipping the server so that the man remembers them, and then they sit on a wall outside the mall where Matthew knows a camera is directly trained on them. Back at the house, Hardis is terrified. He knows he has to kill his father or their holy mission will fail. He makes the garret the way Matthew explained and sneaks into his father's bedroom. Despite being under the influence, the minute Hardis starts to wrap the cord around his father's neck, the man sits bolt upright in bed. Hardis manages to get the cord around once but his father pushes his hands between the cord and his neck before Hardis can tighten it. They start to struggle. The pair fall onto the floor of the bedroom, and punches connect with both men. Hardis screams at his father that he has to die because he doesn't really love them. The man protests, telling his son just to stop. They can forget this ever happened. He does love him. He loves him very much. But Hardis does not stop. His father calls out for his wife and starts to scramble down the hallway. And it is there, halfway to the front door, 
that Johnny Lotta meets his end. Hardas gets the upper hand and sits on his father's back while strangling him. His father loses consciousness within a few minutes, but Hardas sits on his back for fifteen more minutes, pulling the cord tight until all signs of life are gone. The young man sits in the lounge for a while after he's killed his father. He knows he is unable to take his own life, and he is terrified that this now means he will be damned to hell. Shaking, he calls his sister. When Nicky and Matthew realize that Hardis is still alive, they return to the house. Matthew instructs them to cover the bodies with sheets from their beds. Then they construct a new scenario. They will make this look like a targeted attack by the people that have been threatening them. Nikki will say that when she came home from the movies, she found her mother and father dead and her brother tied up in his room. Hardis says already bruised from the fight with his father, so that fits their story that he was beaten up. They then type a letter from the alleged attackers, explaining that the Lotters got what they deserved. Here, Matthew shows his absolute arrogance by addressing the letter to the police and telling them that Nikki, Hardis and Matthew are their suspects. Clearly, he is trying to make it seem as though this is a red herring from the anonymous senders of the threatening messages but the arrogance of pointing police right to them in the hope that they won't look at them is just astounding. Nikki then drops Matthew off at the taxi rank and goes back to the house. At 2am, she phones Matthew. This call is supposed to be her coming home, finding her parents dead, and then calling him in a state of hysteria. When Matthew gets the call, he starts walking to the police station. But first, he phones his mother and tells her that Nikki's parents are dead. Matthew stumbles into the police station and tells the police officers on duty that there are dead bodies at his girlfriend's house. Two constables take some information from Matthew and then drive with him out to the Lotter house. While waiting for police, Nikki checks that her brother knows his story, and then she goes into the kitchen to rub onion under her eyes so that she can cry. It doesn't work, and she has to rely on her acting skills. Hardis is in shock and can barely communicate. He sits staring at the carpet, while the two constables and Matthew arrive at the house. When the constables see the carnage in the home, they immediately cordon off the area and call Detective Duma. He is surprised to see the address he's being asked to respond to. He's been at this house before, he knows. When he walks into the lounge, he is equally surprised to see Matthew Naidu sitting there. He knows that Mrs. Lotta banned the boy from her home. By 4am, Detective Duma has called the Durban Organised Crime Unit. Considering the threats that the family had been receiving, he knows this case is better suited to the unit. He fears that there is far more here than meets the eye. His fears seem to be confirmed when Nicolette points out that there was a letter sitting on the doorstep when she came in. It appears to be from their anonymous stalkers. Investigators from the organised crime unit Tell the siblings that the photographer will come and take photographs of Hardis' injuries. Then they will need to leave the house. Matthew's taken aback. He thought police would come in, investigate, take the bodies and go, and they would be left in the house. His mind starts to race as to what could be in Nicolette's room that would be incriminating. Before the three are guided out of the house, Matthew asks the officer if he can get a jacket for himself and Nicky, as it's cold outside. The officer agrees, and Matthew goes into her room. While there, he grabs his diary and smuggles it out. When the pathologist arrives on the scene, he makes a surprising revelation, which already starts to put the sibling's story in question. He tells investigators 
that Mrs. Lotta died at least two hours before Mr. Lotta. The trio are taken to Westville Police Station in separate vehicles. As soon as detectives start to read Nikki's diaries, they order toxicology tests to be done to rule out drug use. At the police station, social workers care for the three. They're given KFC to eat, which Matthew gobbles down. Hardis and Nikki don't eat. When the three are told that they have been taken to the district surgeon for blood tests and for Hardis's wounds to be tended to, Matthew asks if they're under arrest. The officer responds that they only want to do everything they can to find the people that did this, and he hopes they'll cooperate. Matthew smiles broadly and assures the officer that they will. The three spend the next several hours at the district surgeon. Although the tests are important, police are using this time to gather enough evidence to arrest them. There is already no doubt in their mind that this was not a random attack. The officers buy them food again, and once again Matthew wolfs down more than his fair share, while the other two pick at their food. After hours of waiting, Matthew explodes and demands to know what is going on. He swears at the officers and accuses them of incompetence. Within minutes, investigators from the organised crime unit are snapping handcuffs on the wrists of all three. They're informed that they are under arrest and their cell phones are confiscated. The trio are taken to the organised crime unit's headquarters and a police officer lets Nikki phone her grandmother to inform her of her parents' death. The woman answers, and when her granddaughter tells her that her son Johnny and his wife have been murdered, she lets out a garbled scream, and the phone cuts out. It will later be discovered that Nikki's grandmother had a heart attack and died at hearing the news. The group has taken yet another life. Investigators size up the three people sitting in front of them. Matthew has asked for food again and is munching away, leaving greasy stains everywhere. Hardis gets a look of disgust on his face and stands up, asking to be taken to give his statement. Nikki is then led out to a room adjoining the one her brother is in. Far away from Matthew, but close enough to her brother that she'll later be able to hear his agonised sobs. When she is asked to write her statement about what happened that night, Nikki asks to speak to Matthew. It doesn't take long for Matthew to realise the gig is up. Investigators immediately tell him that they know his alibi is a lie because there are phone calls between him and Nikki during the time he claims they were sitting in the movie. Matthew tries a new tack. He tells police that He does know that the siblings hated their parents because they were being abused, but he doesn't know about the murders. When asked where he lives, Matthew says he lives with his mother, but police have already spoken with his mother and they know that's not true. And when Matthew hears this, it all starts to unravel. For some reason, Matthew initially claims that he killed Mrs. Lotta. Police believe that he did this because he knew that it would taint his confession when the evidence proved that it was Nicky that had killed her, and that would throw any evidence of his involvement into question. Matthew then admits that he had planned the murders, and he says he will provide a statement to police. Investigators notice that the more people that enter the interview room the more Matthew seems to revel in the attention. His manner of speaking becomes more animated, and he seems to love the crowd. He offers to show police where he dumped the evidence. Hardis is initially silent when he's questioned. He repeats the story Matthew gave him like a robot. Once Matthew has taken police to collect the evidence, and it's all laid out on the conference table, Investigators walk Hardis out into the hallway 
and let him watch Matthew chatting away. He's handcuffed there and left to observe how Matthew has revealed all. The ploy works. After ten minutes, with a determined look on his face, Hardis tells investigators he's ready to talk. In a long handwritten statement, Hardis tells police how he believed that Matthew was the son of God. He tells police that they need to go back to the Westville police station. Matthew bragged to him that he'd snuck his diary out of the house when he fetched his jacket, and he flushed some of the pages down the toilet and hid the rest in an unused desk in the interview room. The diary will be recovered, and Matthew's own writings will become important evidence in proving that he had manipulated the pair into believing he was the son of God. The more Hardis is told how Matthew has manipulated and deceived him, the angrier he gets. He cannot believe what he has done for this man. By the end of his statement, Hardis is sobbing in the arms of a female police officer. Nikki is a tougher nut to crack. She insists that she needs to speak to Matthew so that he can tell her what to say. The investigator from the organized crime unit is patient with Nikki. He connects with her over the Bible. She starts to respond to his narrative, and then, when she insists that Matthew is the son of God, he asks Nikki if she knows of a single place in the Bible where Jesus refers to himself as the son of God. Nikki is confused. She actually can't think of a place where this is referenced. But what does that have to do with anything? Well, the investigator says, if Jesus really was the Son of God, and he was humble enough to never refer to himself as such, why would Matthew not have the same humility? Why would he have to convince her that he was the Son of God? He leans over to her and says, Nikki, you have been deceived. The girl bursts into tears. She will later provide a 12-page statement about the events of the night her parents died. Police notice very quickly that both siblings' statements corroborate one another. Only Matthew's statement contains different information. Nikki continues to beg investigators to see Matthew. They know they cannot do this because they need to be kept separated, but one investigator decides to allow the pair to cross paths very briefly under supervision. Nikki is seated in a courtyard smoking area when police walk a handcuffed Matthew through the area. Nikki sees him and walks straight up to him. She demands to know whether he really is the Son of God. Matthew starts laughing at her and looks to the cops around him in amazement. He tells Nikki that her head is not right and she must be confused. Then he starts to blow kisses at her. She asks again if he is the Son of God, and Matthew snarls back at her. There is no God. Nikki is left alone and sobbing with the knowledge that the murder she committed was not part of any holy mission. For Nikki, though, it is more difficult to wrap her head around the idea that Matthew was lying about everything. She starts to believe that he must have been possessed, and she even tries to take the blame for this by believing she's passed her own demon onto him. It's only much later, when two pastors come to visit her in jail, and explain what a cult is, and how manipulation works, that she accepts that she and her brother were wholly duped. She will later, against the advice of her attorney, write a ten-page submission entitled Why My Brother and I Were in a Cult and Didn't Know It. When news of the case hits the media, the public is enthralled. Nikki and Hardis, though, are completely alone. Neither their mother nor their father's families are willing to help them, and there is not a single person that is willing to offer their homes as addresses for the siblings to use in bail applications. As a result, they are unable to apply for bail 
and remain incarcerated while they await trial. Matthew's mother, on the other hand, has mobilized her community in an effort to get her son bail. She puts together a petition called A Popular Petition for the Release of Popular Matthew. But the petition contains first names only, and most telephone numbers don't exist. The judge ends up saying that the petition is not worth the paper it's written on, and dismisses it. Matthew is initially denied bail. The trio spend Christmas in jail, and Donnie Grundling has applied to the Legal Aid Board to represent the siblings in their trial. The board will drag out its decision about his appointment for so long that almost two and a half years will pass before it's determined that Grundling will not be allowed to represent the pair, and they are appointed separate lawyers. During this time, Matthew applies for bail again, and it is granted. His mother sells almost everything she owns to raise the 20,000 rand bail. The siblings launch a high court application for their parents' estate to pay their legal bills. Their sister contests this, and the application is dismissed. It's determined that the estate will be worth approximately 8 million rand. When the trial eventually starts in 2012, all three plead not guilty. Matthew now claims that he had no role in the murders, and Hardis and Nikki's defence will be that they were so significantly controlled that they had no idea what they were doing. The trial is a public spectacle, and Matthew seems to revel in the attention. Hardis remains quiet and often breaks down in tears and Nikki is stoic, shedding tears when she speaks of the abuse she endured at the hands of Matthew Naidu, and her regret at having believed him. The judge will accept that Hardis and Nikki were under the influence of Matthew, but he will also say that this does not detract from their responsibility for their actions. The mitigation of the psychological impact Matthew clearly had on the pair will be reflected in the sentences handed down after all three are found guilty. Nicolette Lotta is given 12 years in prison. Hardis Lotta is given 10 years in prison. And Matthew Naidu is handed down two life sentences. In the years that follow, Matthew Naidu's mother Rita will do everything she can to make her son's life easier in jail. He tells her that he needs certain things in order to pay for his safety in jail, so the woman tells the media that she receives a very precise list every week, which Matthew says his fellow inmates draw up, and she spends 400 rand a week buying poloni, breads, cheese, chicken, coke, and very specific types of fruit. She is sure that it is this that keeps her son safe, I look at this, and I can't help but think that Matthew is just carrying on with his manipulative ways, and very little of that is used to buy his safety. In March 2018, Hardis Lotta is released on a conditional basis. He is essentially on house arrest for the rest of his sentence. He moves in with a pastor he met while in jail, and the man says he keeps to himself and is committed to making something of his life. Later in 2018, Nikki marries a man called Rion Norkia in a jailhouse ceremony. The man saw Nikki when watching the episode of Heiskenuit Vara Lievens dramas about the case, and made contact with her. They fell in love. She was released in 2020, and was required to do community service for four years. Matthew Naidu remains incarcerated. He will be eligible for parole in 2037. As I said at the beginning of this episode, I cannot help but see the stark parallels between this case and the crimes of Cecilia Stain and Electus Perdias in the Krugersdorp murders. The formula for building a cult-like situation with coercive control and abuse is so apparent 
when we look back in hindsight. If I had covered this case before all of the research I did into cults and coercive control for the Devil's Door podcast, I would very likely have said that I can't understand how these two people believed this rubbish. I mean, Matthew's claims were so outrageous that surely they couldn't believe it. But his claims were just the cherry on the cake. He systematically broke them down. In Nikki, he took an already unstable young woman and used her neuroses against her. Then, through financial, physical and sexual abuse, he moulded her into his puppet. Once he had her, getting her brother on board was much easier because the trust was already there. This has been a very long podcast episode, and you may wonder why I find it necessary to document every step of the way in so much detail. The reason is that I believe this is the only way to stop even one other person from falling into a trap like this. If we just look at this from a very high level, it's easy for us to say that this could never happen to us or someone we know. But once you get down into the detail and realize that this was a very well thought out and calculated process of grooming, you start to realize that it may not be that different from some of the relationships you or your friends have experienced. Once again, in this case, religion is used as a weapon, and it is never my intention to point to religion as a cause for any of these acts. Rather, when we start to recognize how easily our beliefs can be turned against us, if we are not clear about what we believe, then we can still enjoy whatever faith system we subscribe to within the bounds of safety. Just as with the Krugersdorp case, I don't believe that the backgrounds to these murders excuse the actions at all. At the end of the day, the court found that despite the manipulation, Hardis and Nicolette still carried out the deeds by their own hand, albeit under coercion. Johnny and Ricky Lotta were not perfect parents. They made their mistakes, just as all parents do but they love their children. And I think that is made clear by how both of them tried to protect them to the very end. How neither parents even had an inkling that they were in danger from their own children. Matthew Naidu didn't just have the Lotters killed. He made the last few months of their lives a living nightmare through threats and intimidation. So much so, that they increased their security to protect themselves from this outside threat. When all the while, the threat was right inside their own home. Thank you for listening to Episode 60, The Lotta Family Murders. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a Spotlight Minisode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Mm -hmm.